Hello, thanks for coming to today's video. We're going to be looking at ischemic stroke and TIA, which stands for transient ischemic attack. So as always, let's start with the definition. Uh, so both of these are decreased blood flow to the brain, which leads to some type of neurological deficit. Um, and so this deficit can be anything from a motor deficit, sensory deficit, uh, ataxia, or even uh, unable to speak, hear, see. So any type of neurological deficit due to decreased blood flow to the brain. So we're, we're talking specifically about ischemic, which um, has to do with either some type of thrombi or emboli. The other type is hemorrhagic, uh, either intracerebral hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage. We're not going to go into that. That's a whole other management and a whole other topic. So just for today, we're going to just talk about the ischemic causes. So let's go ahead and talk about the uh, pathogenesis of ischemic stroke. So um, here, uh, just real quickly, I'm showing the uh, actual, this is the heart here. Um, the aorta and the vessels that actually go into the brain. So this is, uh, here we're showing the carotid artery um, and uh, that's going all the way up to the brain and perfusing the brain. So when we talk about uh, pathogenesis, uh, one of the uh, major causes is going to be some sort of emboli. So these emboli, uh, they can c come from two places. Uh, the first being cardiogenic. So cardiogenic emboli means it starts somewhere in the heart. So we have the heart here. This is the um, uh, left ventricle. Here is the left atrium. So emboli from this area are one of the causes of stroke. And so emboli from this area can, can go up through the uh, aorta, go into the carotid artery, uh, and then you know, c continue moving on into uh, the either the uh, anterior uh, 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 anterior cerebral artery or even the uh, middle cerebral artery. So um, what can cause these emboli from forming here? Well, uh, one thing that can cause it is going to be atrial fibrillation. So in other words, arrhythmias. So the most common uh, arrhythmia is atrial fibrillation, but uh, flutters can cause it as well. And so what happens in atrial fibrillation? In atrial fibrillation, you get an abnormal fluttering or uh, contraction of this area. And so th that leads to blood stasis and eventually leads to a thrombus formation in that area and then this thrombus formation goes into the left ventricle and then it continues like I described earlier. Uh, what else can cause it? Um, not only can you have an uh, atrial fibrillation, but you can have something called a mural thrombus. And mural thrombus typically occur after an MI and this, this happens because you get some sort of damage to the, the left ventricular wall here and so it's not contracting as hard as it's supposed to and again there's going to be stasis in this area and you eventually form a thrombus which then continues up uh, through the aorta just like any other the, uh, other um, emboli. Uh, next, you can also have it in the valvular region. Uh, this can be either a prosthetic valve, uh, this could be a rheumatic valve. Uh, these can also be different vegetations such as an infective endocarditis or Leibniz sac. So uh, these emboli can, can form here and there or on the uh, aorta. And so when these, uh, when these vegetations form here, they sometimes uh, from the movement of the valve, they get knocked off and then again they go up into the uh, brain. Um, DVTs, so now DVTs tend to come in from the right side, so they tend to come in from the veins, so you know usually they go into cause pulmonary embolism. So how can they cause a, uh, cause a uh, DVT, uh, sorry, a, a stroke? That only can occur when it, it's when you have a patent formant of ovale. So what is a patent formant of ovale? This is when there's a, uh, sh there's a hole in the back here, so I drew an arrow here. So when there's a hole in this uh, between the left atrium, the right atrium and the left atrium, and and then that allows the actual thrombus to go f to cross over from the venous side to the arterial side without going through the actual lungs. Also, um, we have the aorta. So in the aorta, you can actually have an athrombotic plaque formed there. So plaques in the aorta can then um, kind of fire off different emboli into the um, brain there. So, uh, and actually aorta is not cardiogenic, this is going to be artery to artery uh, emboli. So you have two types of emboli, either cardiogenic, which I mentioned all in this area, or artery to artery, the first one being the aorta. And not only can be in the aorta, but you can also have a plaque in the carotid artery. So the carotid artery can have a plaque, and so you can see right there, um, these, the, the, uh, the plaque forms here, and then you get a uh, emboli coming off of this. And this you can generally hear on auscultation as a carotid brewery. So these are the emboli. What is another uh, pathogenesis of ischemic stroke? Uh, well, we have thrombus formation. So uh, in thrombus formation, um, 
the a thrombus forms the vessel and slowly occludes it rather than a sudden uh, emboli. Or sometimes the uh, thromba could rupture and then cause a sudden uh, closure of the entire uh, artery. So uh, where do you can you form a thrombus? Primarily in the carotid and vertebral arteries. Uh, these tend to be the kind of larger arteries, and so th that's generally where you f you have these thrombuses. And so what do they do? They tend to uh, decrease blood flow um, uh, to the rest of the brain. So there you can see a uh, thrombus is formed and it's decrease and it's causing stenosis of the artery, and then so there's less blood flow. So what can cause it? Um, atherosclerosis, Takayasu, giant cell arthritis, and even uh, fibromuscular dysplasia. These are different causes of a thrombus being formed in any of these uh, arteries. Now, not only can you have it in the form, formed uh, in these large arteries, but you can sometimes get in these smaller arteries, also known as the intracranial arteries. And these are going to be arteries such as the Circle of Willis, um, which is uh, right here in this area. You can see that we have the Circle of Willis that should be connected there. Uh, and um, you can even have it in some of the more proximal branches of the intracranium. So uh, that's where we have it. Now, um, the final pathogenesis is known as lacunar uh, infarcts. So what are lacunar infarcts? Lacunar infarcts occur in some of the smaller vessels uh, ranging between 30 to 300 micrometers. And this generally is secondary to some sort of hypertension. And so what happens is in these smaller vessels, um, you, ca you know, kind of you can see right here coming off the middle cerebral artery, uh, these smaller vessels uh, with chronic hypertension, uh, they begin to have lipohyalinosis which is a kind of concentric uh, uh, narrowing of the artery, and eventually it leads to um, fibrinoid deposition, which can further occlude the artery. So this tends to happen in smaller arteries because they tend to occlude much quicker than perhaps larger arteries will. And so, um, and we'll talk about specific syndromes related to lacuna infarct. But for right now, just remember, lacuna infarcts tend to happen uh, in smaller vessels. Thrombus tends to happen in larger vessels. And these emboli can occur from the heart or uh, kind of the proximal vessels before going to the brain. So real quick, before we go into risk factors, let's talk about uh, TIAs. So what is a TIA? A TIAA is a transient episode of neurological dysfunction. So um, generally, it's been said that uh, a TIA lasts less than 24 hours. Uh, but that is kind of an arbitrary uh, date stamp. I guess you can say it, an arbitrary time point. Um, so now what they're saying is you can have infarction much earlier than a t, uh, much earlier than 24 hours. So they're maybe trying to define it more as uh, when infarction occurs rather than um, a time, uh, a 24 hour time limit. So if infarction doesn't occur, it's gonna be a TIA. And if infarction does occur, then it's gonna be a stroke. And so less than infarction, by the way, is ischemia. So if you just have some type of ischemia, which is reversible, that becomes TIA. And if it becomes infarcted, necrotic, and irreversible, then it becomes a stroke. So that's the uh, major difference now that they're trying to uh, push towards. And so TIAs increase the risk of a future stroke, and they're associated with different uh, kind of symptoms. Uh, not only do you get a, some type of neurological deficit, but you can also get some type of sudden syncope, uh, amnesia, or you can even get a seizure. Uh, now, there are some differential diagnoses that you do need to keep in mind. Um, the main one being uh, multiple sclerosis, because multiple sclerosis also has this transient nature. Specifically the eye, because both of them uh, can have a transient um, loss of vision. Um, brain tumors and abscesses are also something that definitely needs to be keep in mind, you need to keep in mind, and as well as intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, because intracerebral hemorrhage kind of has this slow, progressive, uh, progressively worsening symptoms. Oh, and TI doesn't have that. TI would generally start and then go away uh, right away. Uh, so now let's go ahead and talk about uh, different risk factors. So these risk factors are going to be similar to uh, that you would get for myocardial ischemia or uh, any of those type of conditions that are kind of uh, related to the vessels. So of course you're going to have hypertension, uh, atherosclerosis, diabetes mellitus, and obesity. So they should be familiar with MI, as well as hypercoagulable states, either inherited, such as factor V laden and those conditions, or acquired, such as you know pregnancy and uh, OCPs and, and all those things. Um, amyloid angiopathy is also another risk factor. Um, as well as, like we talked about before, atrial fibrillation and the MI, uh, they can create those emboli. Uh, a previous trans transient ischemic attack, as well as uh, valvular disease. Again, uh, we're talking about uh, emboli for uh, atrial fibrillation, MI, and valvular disease. They can create those emboli, which can then later uh, lead to uh, stroke. 
So now before we continue any further, it's uh, important to go over uh, real quickly uh, some basic neuroanatomy, uh, particularly pertaining to the blood supply of the brain. So I'm going to have a quick diagram here. In this diagram, uh, you can see in the blue, uh, we have the uh, anterior circulation anterior circulation and in the red in the red back here we have the posterior circulation so when we are defining uh, different types of uh, syndromes related to stroke we go ahead and we divide it based upon whether its symptoms con uh, consistent with areas in the uh, of the posterior circulation or areas uh, kind of uh, from the anterior circulation. So let's first take a look at what's going on in the anterior circulation. So you can see if we start down here, uh, the first artery that we deal with is called the internal carotid artery. So that's our first one and I just call it ICA. Okay and then although it's not uh, mentioned here, uh, there is a branch from the internal carotid artery which goes here and it gives uh, innervation to the eyeball. That's called the uh, ophthalmic artery and it actually gives it to the uh, optic nerve. So this is a very important artery uh, that you should remember and sometimes there are some symptoms uh, that can be related to that. And when we talked about um, the lacuna infarct, sometimes if you get a, um, or was it lacuna infarct or was it, sorry I said I meant uh, transient ischemia attacks. Sometimes if you get in, uh, a transient ischemia attack in the ophthalmic artery, you can get that monocular uh, blindness. So um, this, this gives branch the ophthalmic artery which is very unique. Okay and so then as you continue um, you know, you get you get into the circle of Willis here, which isn't drawn, but you get the circle of Willis right there. Um, the internal carotid artery branches, okay, and it, it, it branches into the anterior. Get a better color here. So it branches. This is anteriorly. So this is going towards the brain, and the anterior uh, is actually going inside, in between the two hemispheres. So if I was to draw the hemispheres, sec here. Go. Okay. So if I was to draw, to draw the two. Uh, brain hemispheres here, um, the anterior artery is going in between backwards uh, through there. So this is going in between. So let's write that down. So you have the anterior uh, cerebral artery, which is this one here going anteriorly. And it also splits into the uh, middle cerebral artery, which is uh, going on the side of the brain. So let's write both. So you have the anterior cerebral artery and you have the middle cerebral artery. So um, we'll have more diagrams to talk about it more specifically, but if at the moment you just remember that uh, you have the internal carotid artery branches to the ophthalmic artery and then gives two branches to the anterior cerebral artery and the um, middle cerebral artery, that's uh, enough to know. Circle of Willis, of course, is a very important uh, uh, artery, but not necessarily when we're talking about strokes, we don't get too much into Circle of Willis. Now, let's talk about the posterior circulation. So the posterior um, circulation actually starts off with the vertebral arteries. And the reason why it's called the vertebral arteries is because it actually goes to the vertebrae. So as you can see, the posterior circulation, uh, the vertebral artery, sorry, is continues in through the back of the brain. Uh, inferior, uh, cerebellar artery. And just kind of, the name kind of tells you exactly what it does. It supplies its posterior and it supplies the inferior cerebellum. Uh, after it gives off that branch, it ex gets, goes into the actual uh, brain, the dura mater, and it, gets, it becomes the basilar artery. So although you can't see it here, what's actually happening is the, uh, there's two vertebral, because it's only looking at one side, right? So you have two vertebral arteries. Uh, I won't draw it here. I'll show, I'm sure it will come up in another uh, diagram soon, but uh, it becomes uh, the vertebral arteries will then turn into basilar arteries. And so just for right now, just remember that the two vertebral arteries are going to join to form one basilar artery. And there are some syndromes associated with uh, basilar arteries, which we will get to. And then um, after that, it goes on and it continues to become the posterior. Uh, you have the, pos you have the uh, superior cerebellar artery. Um, I don't know if any, it's not too important, but it is there. So maybe just for completeness, I'll just uh, mention it. So you have the, um, uh, that's right here, uh, superior uh, cerebellar artery and then you finally you get the uh, posterior uh, cerebral artery so these are the important arteries we're gonna go probably through each of them 
uh, in detail, see what they, uh, and what I like to do is instead of just kind of giving you a long list of what everything, what everything uh, gives blood supply to, I just, as, as we're going through the different conditions, uh, it's, I just find it easier just to talk about uh, what they bl give blood supply and then right away talk about uh, the manifestations that you would get. So now let's go ahead and start talking about the different syndromes that can be seen. Uh, so we'll start the discussion uh, with first of all the anterior circulation. So anterior circulation. Uh, and so as we talked about earlier, uh, the first artery that we will begin with is going to be with the internal carotid artery. So uh, let's go ahead and start with the IC uh, internal carotid artery. So most commonly uh, what happens in the internal carotid artery is you get an uh, atherosclerotic plaque and what this does generally is it just decreases the blood flow uh, that's going through the actual common carotid, uh, sorry, internal carotid artery. And so, so you would think that this would give you general symptoms generalized to the entire brain, but actually no, these, these tend to be asymptomatic and there's a good reason for this. The reason why they tend to be asymptomatic is because the circle of Willis uh, can compensate. So circle of Willis does compensate uh, for the lack of blood flow on one side. So in order for you to have symptoms, you'd have to have a uh, problem with both internal carotid arteries, which is fairly rare. It's very difficult to get that. Uh, however, what you can get is you can get um, uh, you can get the monocular blindness, um, and this is because the actual ophthalmic artery, so if you go back up here, the ophthalmic artery is ahead of the circle of Willis, so you wouldn't be able, to, it would be very difficult to uh, compensate for that artery. So a lot of times the only symptom you'll get is a, a monocular blindness. And the bigger, the bigger trouble with internal carotid artery isn't so much the monocular blindness, but the atherosclerotic plaque oftentimes can cause an emboli, which can then cause other uh, uh, other symptom, uh, other uh, uh, strokes, and pretty much the only way you know this exists is because there's going to be a high pitched brewy. So a high pitched brewy when you put when you also take the the carotid artery, you just hear that brewy, and that signifies that you have some type of uh, atherosclerotic plaque, which is obstructing blood flow. So now moving on, we're going to go into the uh, anterior cerebral arteries and the middle cerebral arteries. So, um, so here we have a diagram of the different areas that the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery uh, serve. Okay, so uh, this yellow portion here, this is going to be your anterior cerebral artery, whereas this red portion here is going to be your middle cerebral artery. And so what happens is the artery actually, for the middle cerebral artery, it actually comes from here in the sylvian uh, fissure and it goes out this way and then it goes ahead and it starts supplying uh, everything here in this area. And um, although we're not going to talk about it, this blue is the posterior cerebral artery, but this is part of the posterior circulation, not the anterior circulation. So we're not going to talk about it r at the moment, but we will get to it when we're discussing that part of the brain. So there are quick things that I want to add uh, just to show what part of the brain does what. Uh, so here you have the central sulcus. So um, anterior to the central sulcus is going to be your motor area and then posterior to your central sulcus is going to be the sensory area. So these, this is the uh, important areas. Also you do have some areas uh, for speech which is going to be Broca's area. Uh, this is only present on the dominant side. So we'll put, put a dominant here. Uh, so dominant Broca's area. And then you have Wernicke's area back here uh, which is for speech comprehension. So this is uh, comprehension and this is actual uh, I guess we can say motor uh, type of uh, being able to actually talk and these are important because depending on uh, depending whether you have these or not you can tell whether it's on the dominant side or the non-dominant side and so what I also want you to pay attention to is uh, this area at the top here is uh, uh, taken over by the uh, anterior cerebral artery and so you have the frontal lobe here which is mainly for thinking and so anterior cerebral artery will tend to uh, affect that a little bit more. So we'll, again, we're going to get into that when we talk about individual syndromes. So here you can just get an idea of uh, how the blood flow is distributed and the different types of uh, symptoms that you would have depending on uh, the part of the brain that's affected. So continuing on, continuing on with the more detailed uh, neuroanatomy of the anterior circulation, uh, here we have a coronal section of the uh, uh, of the brain. Uh, and so here, this is your internal carotid artery that's coming here. Uh, and here we have the middle cerebral artery. So this is your middle cerebral artery. 
And so as you can see, the middle cerebral artery starts from the inside and goes straight to the outside. And then it gives you the uh, inferior branch going down. So you got the inferior branch and then you have the superior branch going up. At the same time, here's your anterior cerebral artery. And so this cerebral artery uh, goes here and then it goes kind of out towards the screen and then it comes up uh, there. So this, these two connect here like that. And so that's the anterior cerebral artery. So um, what's very important to kind of mention in this is you have the homunculus. And so the homunculus is kind of a, a distribution of what gets, uh, what part of the brain controls what part of the body. And so, you know, the homunculus is, you know, kind of a complex picture. I just like to simplify it. So what the way I take a look at it is here you have your lower extremity. So in the, cent in the central area here to about there is going to be your lower, ex lower extremities. And as you go further out, this is going to be your upper extremity, or actually we can say upper body, because uh, then you start getting your face and uh, tongue and everything involved. So what's important to know here is the anterior circulation controls this area over here. And so when you have a problem with your anterior circul circulation, you have a problem with the lower extremity. So remember, anterior circulation, lower extremity. And then, when, and so the rest of this area here is going to be controlled by your middle cerebral artery, and so it's going to affect your upper body. So a very simple, I mean, this is oversimplified, but generally what you can think of is anterior circulation, motor sensory to the lower uh, lower extremities, and um, um, middle uh, middle, circ middle circulation is going to uh, be the uh, upper extremities and the upper body. And what's also important to mention is you can see off the middle cerebral artery, you have these arteries here. Uh, these arteries are the lenticulostriate arteries. So uh, lenticulostriate arteries. And these are the arteries that are involved in lacunar infarcts. And we're going to get into that as well as soon as we're done with the uh, anterior cerebral artery and middle cerebral artery locations. So now that we've done that, now we can go ahead and move to the actual um, functions of each are, are the symptoms of each type of stroke. So let's go ahead and let's, let's uh, make it uh, anterior cerebral artery and middle cerebral artery. So the way I like to do this is talk first about the more salient features and then get into the details. So the, the most important thing you want to remember is both of these are going to give a motor sensory uh, deficit. So you both of these have a motor and a sensory deficit. So how do you tell them apart? Well, the area, the parts of the body that they affect most. So in the middle cerebral artery, it's going to be again upper extremities and face. And these, by the way, both of them are also going to be contralateral. So both of them are contralateral. So and then with so with middle cerebral artery, you have the upper extremities and face. And the anterior cerebral artery is going to be the lower extremities, such as. Pretty much when we're saying lower extremities, we're talking about uh, leg and foot. Now, I wish it was this simple. It's a little bit more complex than this, but again, uh, just try to keep this in mind and then you know just memorize the details. So let's kind of go into more details of what actually happens. So with anterior cerebral artery, yeah, it's predominantly lower extremity, but that doesn't mean there's going to be no upper extremity. There is some slight upper extremity um, issues, and that's just because... Um, you have, so if, you, if we go back up here, uh, some of the corona radiata that goes, goes through to the, some of the parts of the lower extremity kind of pass through here. And so you get, you don't get as much um, upper extremities uh, as lower extremity, but there is, so you, can, you know, there is something there. So you can't say that there's absolutely nothing. Okay. So what's on top of that? You do also get urinary incontinence uh, that is associated with um, anterior cerebral artery and you get something called abulia. Abulia is basically the lack of will. Um, and this, and, and so basically the patient doesn't want to do anything, uh, they're not into anything, and, they, and if you ask them a question, they take a very long time to respond. So abulia is a lack of will, and that's just because it affects the uh, frontal lobe a little bit, uh, whereas the middle cerebral artery doesn't. So that's anterior cerebral artery. So middle cerebral artery, what do you get as well? Uh, so again, we get that contralateral uh, upper extremity and face uh, motor sensory loss. Um, you also can get uh, a decrease in conjugate gaze. Uh, and that's just because the frontal eye field is located in this area. So uh, frontal eye field. So uh, the frontal eye field 
uh, is located generally in this uh, kind of area here, right by, right by the motor uh, area, so then you can get those symptoms of uh, not being able to uh, do have conjugate gaze as well. Uh, also related to the eye, you can get um, uh, homonymous, homonymous uh, hemianopia. Uh, so what is this? Um, I mean, with, with regards to the eye tract, I haven't done the video on that. You want to check that out. But just for right now, just so you know what it is uh, symptomatically, if these are your two eyes, um, you're going to have decreased vision on one half of both sides. And this actually can, uh, depending on where it is specifically, it can also be an uh, uh, inferior uh, quadrantinopia. So you, it can be just so it can just be just uh, one half, the inferior half there, and that's mainly because of the some of the optic tracts. Because you have the uh, you know if your eye is here, some of the optic tracts fall in go go kind of into this region. Some of them go down, some of them go up, and so you can get uh, kind of the optic tract involved. Now, um, what's interesting with uh, middle cerebral artery is depending on which side of the brain it's on, you can get different symptoms. So if it's on the dominant side. And if, and if it's on the non-dominant side, you get different symptoms. And that's because each side of the brain is responsible for different things. So the dominant side tends to be responsible for speech. Uh, that's where the Broca and the um, uh, Wernicke areas is, uh, is placed. So you can get some speech difficulties. Um, and so this can be either, uh, you know, uh, motor aphasia, Motor aphasia. It could be a conduction aphasia, and it could be depending on exactly how it gets. You can get uh, many different things. Now, if it's on the non-dominant side, uh, what you what you get is you get neglect. So uh, basically, they won't know. If it's, say, for example, if their right side is uh, the non-dominant side, then they'll ignore their left side, and so they won't even know it's there. And a lot of times, you get. Uh, uh, anisognosia. So basically you, they won't be able to name things or they won't be able to recognize objects uh, and that sort of thing. So recognition uh, and you know paying attention to I guess certain things and naming them all tend to be on the non-dominant side. So that's become pretty interesting with, with regards to the middle cerebral artery is depending on the symptoms you can actually localize it to which side it is um, rather than the other. Well of course I guess you can say you know because these are contralateral you can do it as well but um, depending on what side it is you actually get completely different symptoms. I guess is another way of putting it. So, um, to summarize it, you get eyes, sensory motor, middle cerebral artery, and then you can get one of these. And then uh, incontinence, abulia, and uh, lower extremities is going to be uh, anterior cerebral artery. Okay, so now that we've talked about those two, um, I, won't, I do want to uh, talk about lacunar infarcts again. And so remember, we already discussed lacunar infarcts. They're kind of infarcts of some of the smaller arteries uh, that exist. And so, we do have small arteries here, the lenticulostriate arteries that we mentioned earlier, and these are branches of the middle cerebral arteries. Now, these aren't the only uh, areas where like, where lacuna infarcts occur, but uh, this is the most commonly uh, mentioned. Uh, so, what happens in you know these patients? How do they present? So, these have a very highly predictive type of syndromes. Um, these are one of the only ways to get a pure motor or a pure sensory loss. So there's very few other, or uh, there might be no other uh, times where you actually get just just a motor or just a sensory loss. So when you see just one or the other, then it's highly suggestive of uh, lacuna infarct. Uh, you can also get ataxia, so they won't be able to, uh, ha you know, they have problems with gait, um, and you know, oftentimes also they'll get nystagmus um, as well. And finally, they get something called a clumsy hand. And so this is basically uh, dysarthria of the uh, arm. So they won't be able to control their arm uh, and it'll just be a little bit clumsier and they tend to use the opposite arm uh, more often. So that's a lacuna infarct. So it's very specific uh, types of syndromes and that's just because uh, you're, you're affecting really small vessels. So you only kind of knock out a very specific function. So that's a good way to memorize. Remember that uh, lacuna infarcts are very specific. So that is the uh, anterior circulation. Now let's talk about the posterior circulation. So what we'll do is um, talk more about the anatomy, kind of go in more in depth. So here, as you can see, we have the vertebral arteries here. So like I kind of mentioned earlier, you have two vertebral arteries. 
um, going down from the back of the neck of the vertebrae and then they come together to form this really thick uh, basilar artery okay so let's just kind of write all these down so first you have uh, two vertebral arteries okay and then we also kind of want to mention is uh, this this does give the anterior spinal artery as well and this goes down into the, the down the entire spinal column so the anterior part of the spine is actually uh, innervated uh, or sorry the blood flow is through the actual vertebral artery so um, and so sometimes you can get quadriparesis if you get a uh, loss of function on both sides um, so uh, so then you have two vertebral arteries which combine to form a basilar artery um, before it goes off and com uh, gets the forms the basilar artery it does give off a branch to the to the posterior inferior cerebral artery or pica so that's uh, another uh, another artery we need to talk about pica here um, and so pica obviously is going to be the cerebellum so uh, the cerebellum is drawn here okay and um, also when we talk about cerebellum you also have the anterior inferior uh, cerebellar artery and then at the top it splits into the uh, superior cerebellar artery so uh, a lot of cerebellar arteries here. So you have pica, ica, and the superior cerebellar artery. So what is controlled here? Um, so what you can notice is you have the entire brain stem. So we have the entire brain stem, uh, which is uh, being controlled by the posterior circulation, as well as the cerebellum. And then to a lesser extent, you have the... Uh, uh, anterior spinal artery which is um, gonna take you know take care of the spine and then not only that but we have the at the very top we have the posterior cerebral artery which splits into that so we also I should have mentioned that here so you also have posterior cerebral artery and so with the posterior cerebral artery you also have the vision uh, because the posterior cerebral artery let's go all the way to the top here so the posterior cerebral artery controls this entire area so, and the biggest part of this is going to be uh, the vision that uh, the patient will lose if they, if they have any uh, problem in that area. So let's go ahead and get started with the different syndromes. Uh, so we'll first start with the um, syndromes affecting the vertebral arteries. So um, when looking at this, the, uh, these are split into two, uh, extracranial and intracranial. So let's just first talk about uh, extracranial. Um, so one of the interesting um, extracranial vertebral arteries. So the most one of the most interesting syndromes is called the uh, subclavian steel syndrome. So let's talk about that first. So we have the uh, subclavian steel. So here we have a nice diagram here. So uh, just to kind of get you oriented, this is the obviously the heart. This is the aortic arch. Here we have the subclavian artery, the left subclavian artery, and then here we have the inanimate artery or the brachiocephalic artery, and that gives the left, uh, sorry, the right, this is the right subclavian artery. So what happens in this situation is you get a blockage in the subclavian. And so one of the first branches of the subclavian is the actual vertebral artery. So this is the vertebral artery, and it comes together as the, uh, so these two will come together as the basilar artery. So when you have a blockage here, um, generally, the patient will be completely asymptomatic. But what happens is when they begin to use their arm, so when they uh, increase the exercise in their arm, uh, the, the there's more blood flow required to go this way. So what will happen is instead of the blood going up, or, or a, a lot of the blood going up, some of the blood that should go up goes down instead because of the, I guess you can say the decreased pressure or uh, the, the increased requirement. And so what happens is whenever they, uh, uh, work out their arm, they start becoming dizzy. Um, they might even start, you know, they, they might get diplopia uh, because obviously the posterior cerebral artery isn't uh, getting enough um, uh, blood flow. They might also get, uh, you know, staggering uh, because of the uh, cerebellum not getting enough blood flow. So the big thing is that you, you will get these symptoms as soon as they begin using their arm. And so it's a very interesting uh, syndrome, I find. Otherwise, besides the subclavian uh, steel syndrome, you can also get uh, atherosclerosis of the vertebral arteries. Um, and these patients generally do tend to 
complain of some pain in the neck. It'll be vague pain, um, nothing you know too uh, too big of a deal. But they'll kind of say there's a pain in the neck or uh, in the occiput, and then they'll have some. Uh, they might have some minor, you know, uh, complaints of dizziness just because of the uh, blood flow is uh, not going completely to the brain. Uh, and if it's more severe, of course, the symptoms will get more severe, and they might even have uh, hemianopia, so they won't be able to see in, out of one eye. But this is only when it's very severe. And to diagnose these, you can't actually listen for a brewery. However, obviously, you would do it in the anterior. Uh, the brewery that you would listen for uh, either would be in the... Uh, supraclavicular region or you can also do it in the just kind of like in the posterior uh, cervical muscles because remember the uh, vertebral artery does go in between the actual vertebrae so you can go uh, into these posterior cervical muscles as well and try to listen for that brewery but generally it's not as easy and straightforward to hear as, as much as you would for the carotid artery so that's the extracranial vertebral arteries uh, now let's go ahead take a look at the uh, intracranial uh, vertebral arteries. So what does the intracranial vertebral arteries uh, supply? The answer is very simple. Uh, they supply the medulla oblongata. So that is the only symptom that you'll get is related to symptoms in the medulla oblongata. So if you kind of look up here, um, so here we have the diagram. Um, as you can see, this area here is the medulla oblongata, right? And so and as you see, the as the uh, vertebral artery comes extracranial, then it becomes it gives off that branch, and it goes intracranial. This entire area from here to here is going to be supplied by the vertebral artery, and then the base of the artery begins to supply the pons, and then you have the midbrain, which is supplied by the uh, posterior cerebral artery and the posterior communicating artery. So when we're talking about symptoms of the medulla oblongata, uh, it tends to get a little complicated because there's so many tracks going. Uh, uh, in and out. So um, generally it's split into two different types of syndromes. Uh, you have the uh, lateral medullary syndrome uh, which means the lateral parts of the medulla are affected and then you have the uh, medial medullary syndrome which means the um, medial part of the medulla oblongata is affected. This is also known as uh, Wallenberg syndrome, um, also known as Pica syndrome because it's the uh, peripheral, uh, sorry, posterior inferior cerebellar artery that's involved. Now, what's also interesting is both uh, both of these syndromes are also known as the uh, crossed syndromes. And the reason why they call them crossed syndromes is that they're going to have a problem with one side of the face and then the opposite side of the body. And so to illustrate that, I kind of have these two uh, icons of uh, these two humans so we can talk about uh, how, the, how the symptoms are and how they're differentiated. So let's just say uh, for this discussion that the uh, lesion here is on the left side. So the, I'll just kind of draw a little bubble in here on the left side. So they got the lesion on the left side. Um, so what symptoms will they have? So in the face... Uh, the symptoms will be ipsilateral. So all the symptoms related to the face are going to be ipsilateral. And then in the, however, in the rest of the body, all the symptoms are going to be contralateral. So what are the symptoms uh, in the lower half of the body? Well, very simple. Uh, the only symptom that these people, will, uh, these patients tend to have is decrease pain and temperature. And so if you know your neuroanatomy or the spinal cords pretty well, Pain temperature is supplied by the spinal thalamic. So this is going to be the uh, primary uh, lesion effect is going to be the spinal thalamic tract. So now, what are the symptoms of the face? Um, the first thing that your the patients will have, uh, they tend to have pain and numbness of the face. And this is related to the uh, trigeminal nerve. So it's right here. Uh, this is related to the fifth nerve. And actually... We'll do all the symptoms in red and then the area of the lesion in blue. These patients also can get uh, nystagmus. Uh, they can have symptoms of diplopia, uh, vertigo, and uh, nausea and vomiting. And so if you're following along and you're trying to get, these are symptoms always related to the uh, vestibular nuclei. So obviously, the, the, in the lateral medullary system, uh, 
uh, syndrome, the vestibular nuclei is affected. Um, you also have symptoms related to dysphagia, which means they can't eat well, and uh, hoarseness, and they have a decreased gag reflex. And these are very distinguishing symptoms. You do not, you know, uh, these are very specific symptoms that you don't really find too often in other syndromes. So this is this is highly uh, distinguishing, and this is due to ninth and tenth um, glossopharyngeal and vagus nerve effect. Um, you also can get um, Horner syndrome as well. So this is one of these syndromes that uh, can cause Horner syndrome. Uh, and if you remember Horner syndrome, it's uh, meiosis, anhydrosis, and ptosis of the eye. Um, we've talked about that in other videos. And so this is just because of the uh, sympathetic chain is involved. So this is, these are going to be your uh, symptoms related to uh, lateral measure. And I know it's a lot, but I do have different ways to memorize them. So just hang in there with me, and then we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit after we finish medial medullary syndrome. So uh, medial medullary syndrome uh, generally affects, uh, it's usually due to the uh, vertebral artery branches, um, and one of them can be the anterior uh, spinal artery, the ASA artery, so uh, that's important. So this is a little bit easier. So again, uh, let's say that the uh, lesion happened on the right side of the uh, individual here, uh, where would the symptoms be? Again, you are going to get uh, symptoms on one side of the face and then on the alternate side of the body. So you get the same pattern here. So when you see this pattern, you're definitely thinking medulla and you're taking verbal artery or the posterior inferior cerebral artery. Um, cerebellar artery, sorry. So what do you get uh, with regards to the face? Well, the symptoms with regard to the face is going to be one, tongue paralysis. So tongue paralysis is the symptom, and uh, this is due to the fact that it involves the uh, 12th cranial nerve. So it involves cranial nerve number 12. Uh, what do you get on the opposite side of the body? Uh, you get paralysis of the entire body. Um, there is going to be no facial uh, symptoms, and you get decreased uh, proprioception. Uh, and this is due to involvement of the uh, medial lemniscus. And um, the paralysis is due to involvement of the pyramidal tract. So again, a lot of symptoms here. A very good way uh, that I've always used to mem remember this is medial starts with M. So this is primarily motor symptoms. And then uh, uh, lateral, another word for lateral is sides. So this and so S is side. So this is going to be sensory symptoms. Okay, and it's also important that we look at a cross-section of the medulla. So what I've done is I've actually drawn, this is the uh, kind of a diagram of the medulla oblongata. I like to draw it because a lot of times those diagrams are just so complicated, overwhelming. I just want to draw a very simplified version. So just to get you oriented, uh, here is your uh, pyramids, the pyramidal tract. Um, out here, these two here, this is going to be your uh, cerebellar peduncle. So these fibers go out to the cerebellum. Uh, this is your spinal canal, the, vent the ventricles, here. So uh, what are important when we're looking at the medial medullary syndrome? So what's most important in medial medullary syndrome is right in the center here, um, we have the, so this area here, uh, this is the medial lemniscus. So uh, the medial lemniscus is coming off of the dorsal column. So all the proprioception um, and fine touch uh, go through here. That we have the, we'll draw it in green here, we have the medial longitudinal fasciculus uh, which is uh, necessary for uh, eye movement and um, finally we have the hyperglossal nucleus here and the actual nerve that goes out to innervate the, th uh, uh, the tongue. And so what I've kind of showed here in the orange is when you have a medial, uh, an infarct which causes the medial medullary syndrome, uh, this entire medial area is going to be affected. So what will be affected? First you have the pyramidal tract which will be affected. And so that's going to cause the motor symptoms that you find, uh, the contralateral uh, hemoparalysis. Uh, then you have the uh, medial lemniscus, uh, which is going to be the uh, proprioception and the fine touch. Above that, you have the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which is for the eye movement, and finally, the hypoglossal uh, nucleus, which uh, causes the uh, unilateral tongue paralysis. So here you can see uh, how the
how all the symptoms of med med medial medullary syndrome uh, come about. And, and so now we can go ahead and we'll talk about uh, the rest of the uh, medulla and kind of uh, take a look at uh, the uh, symptoms caused, why the lateral medullary syndrome has its symptoms. So next to the cerebellar peduncle, uh, we have the trigeminal nuclei. So this is the uh, fifth nerve nuclei. M a little bit more medial to that, uh, we have the nucleus ambiguous. So that's the nucleus ambiguous which is going to be the ninth and tenth and so we talked about the glossopharyngeal and vagus earlier and then um, kind of laterally and just a little bit inferior to there we have uh, you have the uh, spinal cerebellar tract and the spinal thalamic Uh, tucked away in between them, you have the, uh, that's going to be the sympathetic uh, chain that are, are the descending fibers from the sympathetic. And then um, all the way in the back here, uh, this is going to be the uh, vestibular nuclei. And so, uh, as you can guess, all of these, all this area here is affected in the uh, lateral uh, medullary symptoms. So that's going to be, uh, you're going to get the vestibular nuclei affected, you're going to get the um, trigeminal nerve, you're going to get the sympathetic uh, descending uh, nerves going down, uh, you get the nucleus ambiguous is also infected, affected and then that's going to affect the 9th and 12th which is going to be the, sorry 9th and 10th which is going to be the dysphagia and the hoarseness. And then we have the spinal cerebellar tract and the spinal spinothalamic tract, and this gives you the uh, contralateral pain and temperature. So this is just a quick, uh, well, wasn't too quick, but just a, just an overview of uh, the medullary, uh, what happens on the actual medullary level. So now that we've talked about the syndromes related to the uh, intracranial vertebral artery, which is the medullary symptoms, uh, now we can go ahead and discuss. Um, syndrome related to the basilar artery. So um, the basilar artery primarily is going to uh, supply the pons. So this is going to be the pons. So let's take a quick look back up here. So you, as you can see, here's the basilar artery. And so, and this is this area here is the pons. And so uh, the, uh, once the uh, two verbal arteries come together, that, that's immediately where the pons starts. And it goes all the way up to the top, right before the midbrain, you're going to lose the um, basilar artery. So, pond is pretty much the main uh, thing here. Now, um, there's many syndromes related to the ponds, uh, however, not frequently tested. So, going into it might not be um, too helpful. The only thing that you do want to remember is this is where you get locked-in syndrome. And so, locked-in syndrome is when there is no... Um, uh, the patient cannot do, there is no volitional movement, so they cannot move at all uh, volitionally. However, they, their sensory is intact, so they can hear and, and uh, see and uh, um, you know, know what's going on around them and even think. However, they can't talk, so they can't, so no talking, uh, and they can't move. Uh, the only thing they can do is they can move their eyes. Um, that is the only way that they contact uh, with people. So, and it's called locked in because the patient uh, is locked in. He's not able to communicate at all. So sometimes people think these patients are in a coma or they might even be dead. However, the whole time they are alive and they can actually hear and uh, see everything. So it's a very difficult uh, syndrome to have. Uh, so as we're moving on up, we can also then begin to talk about uh, the midbrain. Uh, so midbrain syndrome uh, is pretty easy to figure out uh, because this will tend to affect uh, cranial nerve number three and so that's the ocular motor nerve and so this gives you the uh, down and out plus the ptosis sign and this here is your classic picture here so you can see the eye is down and out and then there's ptosis of the uh, eyeball and on top of that uh, you also get uh, contralateral hemiplegia and by the way this is ipsilateral uh, cranial number two and so uh, these two syndromes together our symptoms. Uh, these. This is known as uh, Weber syndrome. 
So whenever you're suspecting the stroke and the, the, the cranial 3 is involved, it's going to be in the midbrain. And there is another syndrome called uh, Benedict syndrome. So Benedict syndrome is the uh, exact same as Weber syndrome, except they have severe gait abnormalities. So that's, the, that's literally the only difference between these two. And so finally, we can talk about the posterior cerebral artery. Um, and so when you have uh, deficiencies in the posterior cerebral arteries, you're going to have visual disturbances. And it's not necessarily going to be that they can't see, um, which, which does occur, but a lot of times uh, they can get something called uh, visual agnosia. And so visual agnosia is they can actually see it, uh, but they can't name it. So they, so, so they can't uh, name an object that they, that they see. So uh, that's a very important sign uh, to look for there. Um, otherwise, uh, you, you also can get um, uh, homonymous, okay, try this again. Uh, homonymous hemianopia with macular, sp uh, and oftentimes there could be uh, macular sparing. And so you can see here that the macula is spared, and that helps to differentiate between a middle cerebral artery and a posterior cerebral artery. So uh, these are the primary symptoms with posterior cerebral artery, so fairly easy to remember. So here was the uh, clinical uh, signs and symptoms. Uh, now, after you've uh, seen the clinical signs and symptoms, how would you manage it? So we'll talk about management of stroke and transient ischemic attack. Uh, so, f as always, uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to go ahead and do your ABCs, right? So you want to check for airway, breathing, uh, circulation, make sure everything's okay. Um, you also might want to check, uh, so in this you're going to want to check the blood pressure, respiratory rate, heart rate. Um, you're also going to want to check for uh, the blood glucose real quick. And you want to check the uh, ABG, uh, making sure everything's okay, because that's always going to be the first step. And real quick, the reason why you're checking blood glucose is because oftentimes hypoglycemia can present uh, similar to a stroke. So you want to rule that out as soon as possible. And since it's just a little finger prick test, it's uh, fairly easy to do. So uh, that's your first step is get them uh, stabilized if needed. Um, so what do you do after they're stabilized? The first thing that you do is you do a CT non-contrast. And you want to do this as soon as possible uh, because you know what they say is uh, time is brain. So the longer that you wait, uh, the more uh, the problems that you're going to have. And so generally within 25 minutes of them entering your uh, the emergency room door, you have to have them in a CT and contrast, uh, CT non-contrast. So all that. So generally within 24 hours, you're not going to be able to see any infarction or ischemia. But what it can do is it can help rule out hemorrhage. Uh, because if the patient has hemorrhage, uh, then you don't treat them medically. They go in for uh, neurosurgery right away. So you just, you're just you basically ruling out hemorrhage. So if you don't see hemorrhage, uh, then you go ahead and you, you try to see if this patient um, is... Uh, you either do uh, thrombolysis or you can do a thrombolectomy. However, um, and thrombolysis is generally done with... Um, with alteplase. However, there are some contraindications for it. So, we're gonna so let's go real quick and let's look at the contraindications uh, to alteplase or to uh, or to thrombolysis. Because uh, there is a few that, and you have to uh, you know keep these in mind. So, if they have a history of stroke or head trauma. Uh, within the last three months, then it's, then you cannot do you cannot do these this thrombolysis. Also, if they have a history of an intracranial neoplasm or a, uh, a uh, atrial venous malformation or aneurysm, uh, these are contraindications as well. And they could not have had an intracranial or intraspinal uh, surgery uh, recently either. And that is as recent as uh, 14 days. So if they've had uh, any of those surgeries in 14 days, you cannot uh, do it as well. And actually, that actually goes for any surgery. So any surgery in the last 14 days uh, is contraindicated. Okay, so beyond that, uh, any patient w who's presenting with a high BP of uh, greater than 185 over 110, that becomes a contraindication. Or if they have uh, low glucose. 
So glucose at less than 50 milligrams per deciliter, or you can say um, 2.0 moles per liter. Uh, those are contraindications, as well as any internal bleeding. Uh, and this could either be you know, the GIT or even genitourinary uh, within the last 21 days. Finally, um, any coagulopathy, if the patient has any coagulopathy or if they have the use of uh, any anticoagulant recently, is going to be another contraindication. So uh, these, these would be patients with a low platelet count of less than uh, 100,000, an INR of greater than 1.7, and a uh, prothrombin time of greater than 15 seconds. And finally, this all has to occur less than three hours. Um, some They're pushing it now to 4.5 hours, but uh, they say that it doesn't tend to be beneficial after uh, this period. So um, before initiating, uh, the thromboly thrombolytic agents, uh, you need to go ahead and you need to make sure that they don't have these uh, contraindications. So that's important to keep in mind. Uh, thromb thrombolectomies is when they actually go ahead and uh, kind of like a um, stenting in, in the coronary artery with PCI. Uh, we can do that, um, but however, that can all only go up as far as uh, kind of the more of the proximal segments, uh, so you can't, you can't, you know, if it's in the internal carotid artery uh, and maybe into the uh, anterior circulation, uh, that's where it's mostly useful. But besides that, it's uh, difficult to kind of get too far into the brain oftentimes. And your goal is to have this thrombolysis treatment um, within 60 minutes. Uh, so again, when door to treatment time should be around 60 minutes. So now once you've done this, um, you now want to look for the cause. Uh, so what actually caused uh, the event? And so uh, there's many different things you want to chase down. So one of the things you can do is you can do a uh, duplex ultrasound or a, or a Doppler. Uh, and what here what you're looking for is uh, you're looking at the carotid artery and the uh, vertebral artery. And you're looking for either a thrombus uh, that can be causing the symptoms or an emboli, uh, a source of an emboli. So th that's uh, one thing that you can do there. And at the same time, you might want to do a CT angiography or a uh, uh, MRA. Uh, and here what you're looking for is if there's any thrombus uh, within in some of the smaller arteries. And this is also going to... Um, help distinguish uh, you know where the lesion was as well uh, so where the uh, actual stroke occurred uh, if you wanted to uh, figure that out uh, on top of that what's also available is the uh, transcranial Doppler transcranial Doppler again helps identify uh, presence of any thrombus um, that's more intracranial and it can do this in the middle cerebral artery uh, anterior cerebral artery and even the posterior cerebral artery so the transcranial Doppler is able to detect uh, any abnormalities in blood flow in that area. Now you also want to go ahead and do a full cardiac evaluation uh, and this is important because um, remember you can't have emboli coming from the heart uh, and so far what we talked about is more about vessels so what can you do with regards to the heart? Well uh, you can do an echo um, so an echo can, can look for a uh, thrombus uh, in the atria or the ventricle as well as looking at the valves for any uh, septic emboli or, or um, any vegetation that might be on the valve. So that becomes uh, important for that. But you also want to do an ECG, preferably with a uh, Holter monitor. And so in these patients, you're looking for uh, atrial fibrillation. And oftentimes uh, they do for 24 hours, but now they're even promoting uh, doing it for a few weeks. And so here you're looking for patients who have underlying atrial fibrillation, which forms clots in the uh, atrium and then they, they lead to the uh, stroke and often these patients they need to be on uh, some type of anticoagulant depending on uh, how they score on the uh, CHADS2 which we've talked about in other videos. Um, you also want to go ahead and do some lab workup uh, that becomes important so you want to go ahead and do the CBC, hematocrit, uh, white blood cell and platelets so of course if any of these are deranged in that so if if you have a high, like you have polycythemia, obviously that can lead to increased risk of stroke, uh, WBC and, you know, platelets. Uh, platelets, of course, um, 
if they're really high, that can be a hypercoagulable state and lead to thrombus. Uh, WBC, you know, it's vasculitis and, and those issues. Um, you also, get, again, we want to do, we kind of talked about earlier, but we want to do INR, um, a, you know, prothrombin time and uh, platelet time. Also, you want to check the lipid levels. Um, this is going to be, you're looking at either high LDL or low HDL for atherosclerotic risk. And you're, you're looking for any hypercoagulable state uh, that they may be in as well. Um, and so these, these type of patients will generally receive uh, heparin or warfarin. So, uh, so this is um, you know, what you want to do for the cause. And depending on the underlying cause, you want to go ahead and treat them chronically. Um, and all patients um, generally will receive aspirin as well. Um, and before I continue on to prevention, um, there are other things that you want to address. So we've kind of talked about going jumping straight into thrombolysis. However, there are other conditions and uh, things that you may need to address to try and um, limit uh, how severe the symptoms will be. So first is fluids. Um, patients with uh, who have intravascular uh, volume depletion uh, tend to do poorly. So if they have, if they do tend to uh, seem to, uh, dehydrated, you want to go ahead and administer fluids to prevent uh, worsening of the stroke. Second thing is glucose, um, high and low. So if, if you have low glucose, um, this needs to be addressed because it can mimic a stroke. So you just need to go ahead and rule that out. However, if you have high glucose, uh, this, go, this worsens the ischemia. And they, uh, there's many ideas here as why, but they think that it's just because of free radical formation. So you want to try to you know, address both of these uh, to try to limit the amount of um, damage that occurs to the brain. Um, and before you give any, uh, anything orally, you want to do a swelling assessment. Uh, because sometimes, again, uh, these strokes oftentimes can um, lead to damage to the area involved in swallowing. And so then these people can oftentimes aspirate, and that can lead to uh, pneumonia. So keep that in mind uh, before giving anything orally. Also, you want to address any fever. Um, there's many reasons. First of all, as soon as they have fever, you need to rule out uh, meningitis uh, and you know some any type of uh, empyema or brain abscess. So first, you have to uh, keep keep those in mind as well as uh, infective endocarditis. Um, uh, not only that, but um, high fever, uh, high temperature does increase brain damage. It's been shown to do that. So that's why these patients who have high fever, you want to definitely make sure you give them uh, acetaminophen. And finally, um, you if they have high BP, you want to get that control there. Um, and, and you need to make sure that they have low BP, uh, and not only because it's contraindication for a thrombolysis, but patients who uh, have it under control tend to do a little bit better. What to give exactly, there's no, no studies that have done what's best, uh, but uh, people tend to uh, prefer labetalol. That's kind of what's been done clinically. However, there's no evidence uh, supporting that. So uh, that's kind of the treatment there. Um, now, post MI, uh, patients do need, oh, sorry, post MI, post um, stroke, uh, there are most, a lot of patients, depending on the severity of what occurred, uh, they do need to get rehabilitated, um, you know, for. Uh, you know, if they have paralysis or, or uh, weakness, uh, they need to they do need to get uh, rehabilitated for that. Oftentimes, they will need um, DVT prophylaxis because if uh, you get increased risk of uh, another stroke if they're not moving. Um, you also want to put them on aspirin uh, to prevent strokes, and then oftentimes uh, anticoagulants will be necessary uh, if they have uh, if they're in a hypercoagulable state or uh, they have like atrial fibrillation or anything like that. And finally, um, many patients uh, need some sort of uh, carotid stenting if, if, the, if it was coming from the carotid artery, or you could even do a uh, carotid endarterectomy, which I've talked about in other videos. Um, and this just to uh, prevent future strokes and emboli from coming from the uh, carotid plaques if, if they're there. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, it was a little long, but uh, we tried to cover up as much as possible. So um, hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in a future video. Thanks.